you know. In, in the Michael, in the window where all the people are, the video, there's a participant, chat, and then share screen, record reaction. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, managed to do it. Yeah. Do, I, I see, do you uh, see? You know, do you yeah. see my screen now? That's right. Yep, I do. Okay. I do. Got okay. you. Okay, I guess you see the screen. The, the screen that I'm looking at, it says "Send Com Laura" at the top. Yep. Yep. Right? Yeah, great. great. So I, I managed it. Stupid user day. <laughs> no worries, Michael. Right. So did I put my name there? Okay. My name is Michael. The name of the project is Sendcom. Or there's, yeah, the name of the project. Let's just keep it simple. It's Sendcom, and it's basically. I think I can draw on here. Um, this is a Sendcom device. That's what it looks like. And um, if you can, if you obviously many of us have used a Raspberry Pi before, and there's the concept of hardware attached on top or HAT in short. And the Sendcom device here is an HAT for, for a Raspberry Pi devices. All right. So Going back then, going back then to my, you know, I don't think I can switch back and forth from cameras. Maybe, I think everyone knows what a Raspberry Pi looks like. If you look in the, I'm not sure if you can see that. Yep, yep. The one, yep, you can see the, the camera. One, yep. Yeah. So anyway, so if you can imagine this hat device being plugged on top of a Raspberry Pi, that's kind of what happens. I unfortunately am not prepared to demonstrate this, but I do have a, a, a series of pictures here to show the device. So that's how we're going to do this announcement of the project. And on another day, hopefully if Luther invites me back, then we'll do a more comprehensive um, demonstration that may, may be more than 15 minutes. We'll take a half hour or longer. The one thing that's a bit uh, surprising uh, is that some devices like this, um, what is this called? Uh, it's, um, oh, I forgot the name of this thing. It's an Aeon, crap, forgot the name. So Raspberry Pi hats do fit on other computing devices. And this is what we'll probably be testing uh, going forward. Going this is what a uh, Sendcom panel looks like. This is a bare PCB with four Sendcom devices there. You can see on the back that there are no parts to uh, assemble on the back. There's just some gold contacts, which are test points. Actually, it's upside down. Gold contacts, which are test points, and there's no otherwise no parts that go on the bottom layer of the PCB, the top layer of the PCB, if I get, <laughs> that's where all of the parts go. And uh, if you can imagine, okay, it plugs into the Raspberry Pi 40 pin connector on that side. And once you populate this panel, then it begins to look like the device photographs, which I'm showing over here. I can enlarge that. So we take a look at the device itself. So this is a Sendcom device. Um, what I do want to show is that there are two different formats. We're going to do um, one, let's see. So there's, we're gonna call one the Sendcom. E-D-U, and we're gonna call one a uh, D-E-V. So this is a DEV because I'll make that a different color. This is a DEV model because it has a battery connector. It has a USB circuit. It has a external antenna, a SMA connector, a chip antenna. It has a larger MCU and it has a secure element. So there's a number of features which, if you remove them, you end up with a 
with a EDU device, which is kind of a, uh, a minimal device lacking all of these features. And we're hoping to make these available um, to universities and some research institutions. Right, so um, going back to the, going back to the overview here. Once you plug that into a Raspberry Pi, and we've been we've made it so that um, so that Raspberry Pi uh, cases fit very well. So we want this to be self-contained, possibly in a weatherproof case, because as we all know, Laura and Laura Wan works really well outside in forests and natural environments. In fact, what I was so happy to see in Ben's presentation of the community compost device is that I can imagine that the community compost device would work very well in picnic areas, in public areas, parks, places as outside cities where actually there's no internet connectivity. Uh, it might be a good use for a device like the, like the, uh, the CENCOM that we're doing. So it might be good to combine, for example, CENCOM with community compost device, right? This is just one of the applications of uh, what we can do with CENCOM. Um, similar to the community compost, this is non-commercial. CENCOM is a non-commercial project and it's a very small team and uh, we're just getting started in the distribution. So we'll probably be sending out dozens or hundreds of devices to groups, for example, like uh, NYU, the New York University in Shang Shanghai. Um, hopefully I can get some devices out to uh, Hackerspace SG as well, because I think there's a lot of enthusiastic people who like open uh, source uh, hardware and open interfaces, things like sub gigahertz, low power, long range devices. Anyway, here's another photograph of the CENTCOM device taken from a different angle. And so at this point, uh, because I'm not prepared to demonstrate it, um, I'll take questions and then we'll do a quick run over of the project, its repository, uh, the blog, some information that's online. But before we move away from the uh, hardware itself, does anybody have questions about if it's four layer, if fabrication is simple, where to find the source? Any questions at all before we do our next five to 10 minute um, uh, uh, stretch? And then I'll end the Well, I have a question. What is it? <laughs> Was it a four? <laughs> I have seen a circuit board. <laughs> Okay, yeah, this SendCom device, once you plug it into a Raspberry Pi, you can access it over the UART connector and command it to send LoRa packets to a LoRaWAN gateway so it can transmit uh, sensor uh, collected data, basically any data. You can trans transmit a simple number if you wish to other SendCom devices, to other LoRa devices, and to LoRaWAN gateways. So what you saw before in Ben's presentation, for example, using Things Speak as uh, the collector of data, you need a transmitter to send the data from the community composter to the Things Speak server somewhere in the world. There needs to be a transmitter, either an Ethernet transmitter or a Wi-Fi transmitter. And if you're not internet connected, it can be a LoRaWAN transmitter. Do you understand how this fits into the picture then? Because this LoRaWAN yes, yes. transmitter, which we call CENTCOM, can collect the data from a community composter and send it to uh, ThingSpeak over a LoRaWAN uh, network. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, so I'm aware of the, uh, the MQTT, for example, and the ESP32 have LoRa integration on the chip, so, so there's nothing more needed. Would this just be the same thing, or or how does it differ from the ESP with a LoRa? So I'm not aware of ESP chips that have an integrated LoRaWAN, uh, a LoRa transceiver. That's something new to me. If well, that's not the, the chip case, itself. It's just uh, the module, right? It's a module. It's, it's the size of a normal ESP module uh, with the pins and, and USB port and everything, and has LoRa. They cost about uh, thirty dollars or something. 
Yes, that's so, right. So I, I'm going to rephrase your question and right. I'm going to say, uh, is the CENTCOM device the only um, such hat or module in the worst that in the world that allows uh, a, a LoRa developer to transmit data over LoRa networks? And the answer is no, there are a lot of other similar hats, modules, shields and such devices and, and at least one fits on a ESP developer kit and um, can do the same exact thing that the CENCOM does. In fact, if you uh, bridge these two pins here, which are the UART connect connection, it's a RX and TX for transmit, and you connect that to an ESP, then ESP32, whatever, then you end up with exactly what you're talking about. Ah, That's okay. another way to answer the question. <laughs> right. Any other questions well, so, um, before I... Let, let me just paraphrase the, the thing. The, the utility of the thing you built here is that it's a, it's a, 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 a physical box which could have a hard drive and it could be a server and it could run the MQTT and it could be the gateway for the network for for uh, for other things where maybe cheaper devices having sensors. Uh, is that uh, one way of, of using this thing? Yeah, that is one way of using it, is to combine this on an ESP device, or we've made it to fit very nicely with a Raspberry Pi, but it can be used with a BBC micro bit or an Arduino right. or any number of devices that can, that can communicate over serial, uh, for example, RS-232 or UART connectors. That's okay. how the ESP32 developer kits can uh, use LoRa and LoRaWAN devices over their serial connectors. So okay. that is yeah. one way to think of it. Do you have a price point of this board with the components? What does it cost to uh, assemble? Okay, yeah, uh, so let me then, I, I, I need to go to the next uh, uh, part uh, of the maybe presentation maybe before you to go, answer that question. Maybe before you okay. go, uh, so, so the advantage of uh, LoRa Compared to Ethernet, etc., or, or the or the Sigfox or whatever network, is that this LoRa you can have a connection point to point or a mesh, which is you don't need a license, right? You don't need to to pay anyone. Two two LoRa devices can talk to each other without any any license to pay, right? So it's you create your own LoRa thing, right? That's right, Brahim. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, 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 so from, from so... that from that point of view, is that uh, I mean, if, if we look at the case of Singapore, is LoRa already um, validated in Singapore and, and everything else, right? Well, I don't know that much about Singapore. Okay. I okay. know that almost all well-developed areas in the world, and the Singapore is obviously included in this, have uh, airwaves licensing uh, regulation. You know, there's you're allowed to start a Wi-Fi access point because this is an ISM band of 2.4 gigahertz. ISM stands for Instrumentation and Medical Instruments and Science uh, Airwaves. So a person who buys an, uh, a, an access point on 2.4 gigahertz doesn't need to pay a license fee. It's the same thing with LoRaWAN. LoRaWAN is using, in many parts of the world, approximately 900 megahertz. This is unlicensed airwaves. The license fees you were talking about before with Sigfox is a different thing. That's, I, I think starting to talk about that, we will get confused partially because I'm not so knowledgeable in Sigfox. But the LoRa is uh, in Asia is uh, 433, where in Europe is, uh, let's say, 868. I, I just read from the web. From the so it means that the chip that you have on that board is also compatible e everywhere. The, all these LoRa chip actually um, have a kind of configuration that will us will allow us to use them easily in Singapore. Yes, the answer okay, okay. to the question is if this device is able to transmit LoRa modulated radio at all of these different uh, worldwide. Uh, frequencies, the answer is yes. It's okay. user configurable and it's very easy. Uh, it makes it easy for you. It basically asks you at the very beginning of its uh, menu 
which area are you in and is this the frequency that you want? So it's kind of built into all the different layers, the application layer that the user sees on the screen, the uh, modulation layer that the transceiver is modulating at, those frequencies are all part of this. And Brahim, you're right that most of Asia does typically use 433 for the frequency. This is a problem for us. When we have different frequencies, such as 915 megahertz, which is North America, uh, 868, which is EU, all of these frequencies, you can see they're close to 900 megahertz. So these type of antennas, which are made for 900 megahertz transmission, when you start to, when you start to tell it to transmit at 400 megahertz transmission, you can imagine it doesn't work very well. And that's the limitation that you're also asking about. Will these devices successfully work in Asian environments, which typically use 433 megahertz? I think they won't, but I think so when you buy a LoRaWAN device, I did this for an ESP32 once, it came from Asia to my door in EU, and it, I immediately could tell that, it, that it, the antenna resonated at 400 megahertz. It would work, but only if I was communicating with other devices in the same room, because okay. the, you know, it still works, but you will, you will have terrible range. Does that make sense, Brahim? Yeah, yeah okay. I, I just want to, to check because... Uh... Uh, you know, if, if you push such a device, let's say in Singapore for university, school, etc., we should be quite sure that, you know, things are working properly. Also that the, I'm not a, a radio amateur like some of our colleagues uh, who are part of the, the hacker web, but some of our colleagues have uh, friends, I would say colleagues, uh, you know, uh, uh, know more about the regulation. And I think in Singapore, uh, we have to be very careful, but, you know, what, what do we emit at what frequency? Uh, the rules are a bit more uh, strict than uh, elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, well, I think there's so, lots yeah, of us. That well, share I'm sure that when, you, when you present your, you know, the tools, the GitHub, the API, we can we can you know see the the kind of uh, compatibility letter with with uh, Asia potential customers for us to you know we, we can buy some of those boards, especially that a lot of us have a Raspberry Pis around, so actually it'd be nice to. Uh, create a mesh. <laughs> of, of yeah, the exactly. Point. There's there's a lot of uses for LoRa and LoRaWAN technology, like uh, um, uh, um, like catastrophes when the internet is not working because of whatever EMP. <laughs> In any case, um, before we stop talking about frequencies, I'm not sure which countries in Asia are um, are usually are commonly using 433 megahertz, but only out of practice. I believe that China, for example, does have a 900 megahertz band that is licensed or not, you know, unlicensed and you can use it. I, I'm not so clear about that yet. For obvious reasons, we're mostly focusing on the approximately 900 megahertz bands. It's actually impossible without making two different uh, uh, circuits um, circuits to serve these two frequencies. So it's a problem that we have identified, Brahim, just like you have mentioned, and we're working on it, but we don't know how to solve it in the best way. Any other questions? Do you have a question, Luther? Yeah, I was on mute. No, I'm good. I think uh, okay, Jonah great. just mentioned in our Zoom chat that uh, Hong Kong a few years ago uh, did require permit for LoRa frequencies. Yeah. Yeah, but please, okay. uh, yeah, carry on. Yeah, so it, it's it's certainly not so easy to control uh, <laughs> our design to work in every city of the world and to understand they're changing legal jurisdictions. One year, one is going to switch from 868 to 900. The next year, we 915. Other regions will switch to 433. That's a problem that we definitely will always have, just like all of the other manufacturers. All right, so I'm going to switch to, to my browser now to explain where to get more information. First, let's take a look at if you're not so knowledgeable at, with LoRaWAN in particular, it's rather easy to find sites just by simply searching for Lora and LoRaWAN. Here's another one. Actility has a lot of general purpose information and documents. LoRaWAN, what is it? And you can take a look at here. 
key benefits, et cetera, then there is a site. Um, there's a Wikipedia site. This is a bit difficult to get my screen to. Anyway, all right. So um, this is the Wikipedia site for um, Laura and Laura Wan. I'll just mention one one thing to take to understand. Laura is the modulation controlled by a company called Semtech. It's partially open source, but not all of it is. Laura Wan is a specification. I believe it's fully open source. Um, which uh, is no longer, this is not peer-to-peer -peer as Brahim, no, I can't remember who asked about peer-to-peer, -peer, but when two devices communicate with each other without any gateway in between, then you are not doing LoRaWAN, you are doing LoRa instead between those two devices. So that's one important distinction. And can I go to the next one is... Here is a Things Network, another important site to look at. Things Network, this is kind of similar to, to Ben's uh, Things Speak, but this is simply a transport. This is just about communication. This is not about collecting and uh, displaying data. So these are the type of sites that you might want to look at if you're trying to get a general impression of what LoRa is and what it isn't. And if you want a specific impression about the, the project, the CENTCOM project, it's being hosted by the company called Europa Lab Devices. Oh, uh, and I believe this is German. I apologize. <laughs> How can I quickly change the year maybe? Yeah. And so you can explore the different uh, projects. There's very few at this time. There's a few um, projects which are not open source. Uh, and this one is open source. So this is a democratic SendCom project. And these are, this is basically where we do our work and commit our um, changes to. This is jit.europalab.com for all of those people who would like to download a KiCad uh, project, for example. I'll just um, show you through the different areas. You can look at the firmware there. Let's take a look at what applications we're um, we're interested in, in showing for the first time. Here's a peer-to-peer -peer application. You need two CENTCOM devices to have this peer-to-peer -peer application work. Um, a LoRaWAN OTAA or on the over the air uh, registration style application is here. Here's just a hello world. This is all the firmware. Software, we're not producing software. Software is what would run in a, in a, a web interface or a mobile phone or a Macintosh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, co cobalt or carbon, all of this stuff is software. And this project does not include requirements for any software at all. So the way to use these applications, for example, in the firmware, in the firmware directory, is by connecting your Raspberry Pi and accessing it over the serial interface. Right? This is what's going to inter interest most people is the hardware uh, subdirectory. This is where, for example, I'm gonna have to clean this up a bit. There's too many files, but this is where you have your DSCOM Pro file here. This is a project for KiCad. You have our master uh, uh, schematic, which is a SCH file. Um, and you have some, for example, here's the master layout, the keycad.pcb. Now, because if, if I click on some of these files, then all you end up with is difficult to read um, uh, raw text. This is, will take a little bit to load. This is what you see. It's a very long file. And it's not so useful. You can kind of understand a little bit about this here but you can't see any, any traces or graphics. So if you're interested in the hardware, then there is a, so I don't know why. Yeah. Michael, another three more minutes in terms of your time, but you can, you know, hang out later, right? Okay, I will finish this up quickly then. Why is this not? So I'll just move on, I guess. I was hoping to 
was hoping to show the PDF. I don't know if I lost my connection or what's happening here. All right, so this is a different website. It's ma mainly the blog. This is newseuropalab.com. And most of the status reporting is about this project, Democratic CENTCOM. So you can see there's about 10 entries, which are all about this uh, project. This is another place to get your information. This is news.europalab.com. Um, an example of how this looks to the user is here. And now I think, Brahim, you can more fully understand when you're choosing the band. Um, uh, it doesn't show the screen where you choose the frequency and band, unfortunately. I thought it would, so sorry about that. Um, the last is, okay, this is doc, which is not well developed. I don't have the documents there yet. And we're also developing a workshop, like a training or educational environment for the device here. So these are kind of the project specific areas that people can try to look at if they're interested in more information about the device. This one, which seems to have crashed. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so I think I'm done speaking about the project. This was an announcement uh, of the Democratic CENTCOM and I didn't do any demonstrations, but I hope that if there is time on another day on another uh, a meeting that I will be able to do to demonstrate the device. Are there any questions about the project? Yeah, I think Fazli has a question. Fazli, was, uh, Fazli you're there? Uh, yes, uh, no, actually I was uh, just reminding, uh, I think someone asked about the price just now, the price point. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> we, we we can we didn't. So so what? So it, it is in this repository, which seems to seems. I don't know why it's not responding. So the the bill of materials. Okay, here it is. Let's try one more time. I'll try to do this within a minute. It's going very slow. See, maybe there's so many people that are interested in the project. They're all bombarding the, okay, here it is. So we have the bill of materials here. And if you take a look, uh, there is no PDF. Let's go back to the PDF of variants, the print here. And the bill of materials is a PDF file. And this is kind of the nice representation. It shows you the bill of materials, I will make this larger, say about 200%. And you can see the different parts, which is the traditional bill of materials, the, the design, designators. And at the very bottom, uh, you can see that there are 63 unique parts with 110 parts total quantity. And at the very right-hand side, you can see some of the, the, the uh, costs. So for a person who buys exactly one, <laughs> of one inductor, one uh, antenna connector, one resistor for all of these different parts, then you end up with the highest cost of 48 euros total net cost. For a person who buys enough to make 1,000 devices, then obviously the total net cost goes way down. So does this answer the question of what the parts cost of this device is? Or is there another question about the cost, like assembly, uh, is there any question about costs and prices? Yeah, what's, what's the estimate, like uh, a full board like that, uh, which, which can sit on a Raspberry Pi? How much are we looking at? Right, if you make this yourself, which means there is no assembly cost because you're using a, 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 a tweezers to assemble it by yourself and you pay for all of the parts, then the cost is about 50 euros. If you make several at the same time, or you don't need to buy all of the all of the parts because you have some in your lab already, then obviously the price goes down. If a person like probably, I'm not sure we're going to commercialize this. If we do, then we will obviously uh, we will obviously uh, produce a hundred to a thousand of these devices at once, and that price will come down to I assume uh, it will it would have cost us probably. 20 euros in parts and another 10 or 15 euros 
in assembly costs. The reason that assembly is so expensive, Fosley, is because we have some BGA in there. We have a BGA half millimeter pin to pin pitch with 88 balls, which is kind of challenging. Um, mm. But that's kind of a, a rundown of the costs. Does that make sense to you? Or do you think your costs, if you were making this device, Fosley, in Singapore, would it be higher or lower? <laughs> no idea. Probably higher. <laughs> That's a clear answer. <laughs> no, 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 but I, mean, I, I guess if if all if all the files are available on your GitHub, someone lo loaded into uh, KiCad. KiCad has um, some sort of plugin to actually uh, talk to some um, whatever GB GB PCB or whatever in China, and then you know, you know, someone could assess how much it actually costs. Uh, you know, to to really get the board being done. Sold it and tested somehow, you know. So I guess we could estimate, uh, but but somehow, like clearly, it would be less than fifty euro because that would be like you know us soldering a BGA, etc. So first of all, yeah, when you sold BGA, I think you need some proper equipment. Uh, so so, and I would like to know uh, uh, the the choice of those of those component. Uh, compared to alternatives, because there are some hat, uh, LoRa hats for for Raspberry Pi already. If I Google a bit, I find two. Uh, so what would be the advantage to, to use that, you know, your, your, your board versus another one, which is already on seed, whatever, or all these kind of famous, uh, uh, like, like website. Do you have like a, you know, like a, like a specific aspect that, that, that would convince people to say, oh, I, I want this one more than others? Let's say the, well, chip, the, chip, question, the, the chip is an SX. Uh, uh, when I read LoRa, they all say SX1278. Uh, so I assume that all of, all of these boards are using the same chips. Um, um, I, 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 I'm not sure if the guy is online, but there's, there's someone I follow on Twitter who's really into LoRa in Singapore. So I think this is the person we could, you know, try to make you in contact. Uh, I, I don't know the name. Um, Darling, can you get me my phone, my mobile phone, please? Uh, I, I follow one guy on Twitter, uh, you know, and he's very Laura. I, I read all these, all these. Uh, yeah, yeah. Loop, yeah. Loop check. Yeah, yeah. So that's someone say on the chat. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> uh, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, yeah. Loop. Loop Chang is someone in Singapore who's really into. Uh, Luke Chen, sorry, uh, really, oh yeah, uh, uh, no, it's not online tonight, but uh, it's some, someone who's really into LoRa, uh, so I think this is someone really, uh, you know, if you if you try to push this in, in Singapore or, or have some kind of, a, that, that would be nice to even create a workshop or something like that, 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 that should, uh, you know, how things get plugged, you know, it convinced people to, uh, not, not everybody's, uh, I mean, I, I for one don't sell the surface mount stuff, so I, I would have to, you know, either you buy it or or, or you get someone to to solder it for you, I guess. Yeah, we did have the conversation for a short time on Telegram about uh, what type of vendors and distributors in Asia are good to approach for selling your own. Uh, makerspace style hardware uh, like this. Mm -hmm. So, and Fosley had a comment about that. I think there's people more knowledgeable than me when it comes to distribution and that, than um, me also. sales. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think if, if so someone that's... like me is interested in a card like this, uh, I would like to be sure that, you know, I plug the thing on my Raspberry Pi, the driver, I mean, you know, you, you can have a couple of lines of command to install the driver. Uh, and then suddenly, like you know, you buy two, and you and you can make them talk 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 to each other. Uh, one thing is sure that LoRa is uh, you create your own network, so that's one of the the great advantage of it. But in terms of of range, in terms of of uh, of bandwidth, uh, latency, these are I think parameters that people should be uh, uh, aware when when they step into the LoRa ecosystem and, and, and world in a sense um, because I, I, I would assume that this has less bandwidth than Wi-Fi um, 
and in, in terms of range, it's actually you know better than Wi-Fi, I guess, uh, if I'm not wrong. Fazil, <laughs> Fazil. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hi. So I have a question. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. Different uh, from yeah. Hi, I'm GP here. I have a question. So uh, slightly different from uh, what. Uh, the question we asked. Okay, I briefly just went in and take a look at uh, law. Uh, people do job positioning with Laura. So um, I would like to hear from you if you have any experience on this that you would like to share. Thank you. Uh, sure, GP, but I, I don't understand the specific question. I would like to share uh, information for uh, you. Joe, what, what is the question? Job positioning. That means uh, using Laura to actually uh, to to let you know that this device uh, where it is uh, is located. Geo positioning. You know, yep. Now I understand the question. So this device, the Sencom, does not have um, uh, does not have a receiver, a GPS receiver. It does not have that. Doesn't have uh, things that are useful for geo positioning. So what you would need to do is combine this with uh, whatever you use for geo-positioning. Um, what we're not trying to solve are specific problems like forestry, altitude, weather balloons, um, heating, tsunami detection. We're not really trying to focus on geo-positioning or uh, combining to with microwave links, or we're trying to make this available for institutions like universities who then take the device and discover its specifications. They put it to use in their legal environments like 900 megahertz, and they develop uh, work, uh, uh, work groups. No, they, they develop um, types. track classes and so on using this hardware. So we will definitely create a user manual and a few things like that, but we don't have the resources to explore individual applications like geopositioning. But maybe you, GP Lee, uh, GPE, would uh, like, to, if you're close to the uh, Singapore hacker space, you might be able to find one there. I'm hoping to make them available there. And then you could do the work that is meaningful to you if you like an application like geopositioning, that maybe you could combine the CENTCOM device with whatever geopositioning tools that you're already using. Do you think that's re realistic? Yeah, I, I think so because my initial thought is that the signal itself may may help in uh, finding out the location device. So it's I actually it, it's actually it's based on the the GPS signal itself instead of the six fold signal. Yeah, but I I don't think that's the case with LoRaWAN. So uh, triangulation of Wi Fi two point four gigahertz um, signals has been attempted and works well sometimes. Bluetooth is known as well to allow for some triangulation um, because usually you have a constant wave. So your modulated signal is going forever. Unfortunately, with LoRaWAN, we have what we call a chirp protocol. So we have a, a wave here, we have a piece of a sign wave there, a new one there you know, and then 10 seconds go by, and then we have another piece. These are chirps, right? And because we're not transmitting all the time like a continuous wave, it makes triangulation of these devices extremely difficult. Does that make sense? So I'm not sure if LoRaWAN itself can be used for geopositioning. This is why so many LoRaWAN transceivers are accompanied with a GPS transceiver that is on the same PCB. If any of you have a LoRaWAN transceiver at home for ESP or whatever, it's really common to see a GPS transceiver located next to that for exactly this application. Understand, okay, thank you. Any other questions or shall we go back to Luther? Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, I, I think it's a very, very interesting discussion. I think uh, for both talks, you know, there's a lot of uh, audience participation and I, we definitely have gone uh, gone past that at the time. But, you know, I, I think um, 
uh, let's say I was actually going to actually you know, end the session because we actually had, uh, went uh, overstretched quite a little bit. But you know, that's assured. You know, the Zoom, the Zoom, uh, the Zoom uh, session will still be in place. You can hang out. You can you know uh, chat with Michael, chat with uh, Benjamin. I think you know. I encourage you all to turn on your cameras because you want to make, even though this is actually a virtual Zoom meetup, you want to make it, you know, as you know, um, realistic as a physical meetup as close to that as possible, right? And uh, so, thank you very much, everyone, for your time and for your uh, fantastic discussions. And you know, if you have not already, our oh hi, oh Anna, that's you. Hi, I see Anna in the camera. And uh, yeah, if you have not joined our Telegram or our Discord group, please, you know, feel, feel free to actually join the group and definitely also our Facebook group. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, please uh, hang out and chill. And I think um, you, for anybody who has questions for Michael, please uh, carry on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Good meet up, guys. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> so uh, far. Michael, uh, Try, try, try to register to the to our uh, Discord, maybe server, hack. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, this is in the Telegram. Telegram. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Th then we can um, we can yeah cr create some LoRa mesh in Singapore. Yeah, yeah. This. Yeah, I already, Ibrahim, I'm already on the Telegram channel, and I believe Discord is just a bridge, so there's no need to register okay. there as well. On the Telegram thing, okay. If you can yeah, share I your think... your uh, your slides or your the links on the Telegram group, we can repost on Facebook and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This you you want you want this uh, slide this okay uh, sure I think I can do that it's a good idea I didn't think of that Fosley but it's a good idea. Put the image so we we can uh, advertise it through through our web or Facebook. Yeah, yeah, I will do it. Yeah, but um, so actually, Michael, just to follow up on your question, so you were are you looking for uh, what's it called distribution channels for this? Like, you know, people who are, who are like Seed or I don't know. Uh, I brought up Citron in the Telegram chat. Is that yeah, fastly? Uh, I I. Because we're doing so much work to produce the devices now, and we need to uh, serve universities and research institutes uh, first, then that's why we haven't focused or, or made a, a distribution plan for commercial environments like Seed, like 12 Geeks, and mm. so on. But the answer to your question, are we interested in distribution in commercial environments, is definitely yes. What I would like, say in two, three months, is to have at least I'll reach out to say 10 distributors. And I'm hopeful that at least three, maybe even four or five of them request a package of devices, a minimum order quantity, let's say 50. Uh, let's say a couple of them will request uh, 200. I can produce up to 1,000. And they receive them, put them up for sale in 12 Geeks. And that's my very overview level generic uh, hope for the commercialization. Does that make sense? Do you think that's practical? Um, yeah, of course. So, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I just wanted you to put it out there and I don't know, uh, anyone else who is on this chat also, maybe could think about it. Uh, yeah, so I think yeah. uh, Anand was sharing that, you know, there's four stages coming up. So I think that's another I'm not sure that Michael, you're aware of uh, Force Asia. It's a conference, open source conference in, in Asia. So I think that's uh, another. Asia. Yeah, so I think that's another possible platform for you to actually, you know, create publicity and more awareness. So thank God. Luther, do you know when the next uh, Force Asia is taking place? I, I think very soon. March, is it? March, March. I think, uh, what's his name, Mas? Roland, Roland. Uh... Roland, is yeah. it Roland in here? Roland was in here just now. He, he was in here, yeah. Yeah, but he left. Yeah. Do you know if the what's the call call for papers are closed already? CFPs? I think it's on Facebook you send a reminder or something like that, I think. Okay. Yeah, maybe we can send Michael the link. Yeah. Well, I yeah, that's nice, Fazli, but I know Hong Fook very well and Mario oh, as well. Yeah, great. I think they're oh, the yeah, founders Mario, of course. Of yeah, they are in Germany yeah, right now. <laughs> so um I'm very well in touch with them. In fact, one of the the ideas we've had 
uh, is to make a CENTCOM format device for not only Raspberry Pi, but for their pocket science lab, a PSL device, which they are distributing, for example, I think on 12 Geeks, you can buy the pocket science lab and yeah. it has GPIO connectors and the UART connector that would be very easy to make a CENTCOM device for that. So there's all kinds of reasons to get involved with FOSS Asia and to try to u bring these two projects together. But I, in fact, I've talked to Mario about this. So the very first um, mentions have been made, but it's good to know if it's March, you know, if it's coming up FOSS Asia again, that maybe I should hurry up, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe you can do your full display there. <laughs> As a follow-up, yeah, idea. not not just the twenty people in Hackware. <laughs> yeah, well, somebody I can't remember if it was you, Brahim, or somebody mentioned there is a person very uh, in depth involved in LoRaWAN in Singapore, and mm. you wanted to have me contact them or the other way around. So I wrote my name on the Telegram channel. Now that's one of the ways that you can pass my information on to them. We really appreciate if you did that. I don't know this person. Uh, let me and get I, my phone. I really first. like Singapore. Yeah. Oh. I have a question for you. Are there any university environments, higher education style institutions in Singapore that I might be able to meet a professor in order to send them a package of 20, 30, 50 devices and they use them in a classroom environment? Can anybody give me a couple names of universities? Mm. Uh, well, there's only like three universities in Singapore. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I mean, there's NUS and NTU. Uh, yeah, you can approach them. Um, yeah, but, but we'll find out the exact um, professors who you can get in touch with. Which other school will be good? Yeah, NUS and NTU. Uh, I'm not on Telegram uh, hacker hackerware. Telegram is is kind of work now. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I will add, add myself and then I, I, I'll send those link. Uh, for Asia, it's uh, 13 to 21st of March to 2021. So I guess it's going to be okay. online over over a few days. Uh, uh, yeah, to be honest, because it's going to be online, I think it's going to be a massive amount of uh, of people <laughs> participating because they don't have to be physically. Uh, no, it, it, yeah, it was a video in the. Uh, Michael, uh, one question for you: Does um, do all bots with Laura use the same chip, or do they have man different manufacturers? I know the Semtech and. Is it, are there any other chips producers? Yeah, if you asked that question one year ago, I would have said there is only Semtech manufactured LoRa chips on the market. Um, but even that question, you have the SX1276, which is only useful for one channel. So this is what most LoRa nodes are built on, the Semtech SX1276. If you have a gateway, it needs to listen and transmit on eight to 16 channels at once. So it's a different chip, but it's also from Semtech. Semtech is kind of the monopoly uh, figure in LoRaWAN. However, since 2020, in fact, I think maybe 2021 is the first year that ST Micro um, is creating, let's see if I get this right, it's called the uh, STM 32 WLE5. And this contains zero Semtech technology. Ooh. It's all ST. This is a really, really hot device um, for a number of reasons. I, I mean, it's, there's there's presentations that go on for hours about the device because it's packed with so many interesting features. And so the SDM 32 WLE5 is one example of a non-Semtech LoRa modulation transceiver that's combined with a MCU. Uh, the one that we're using is also a very new chip. It's called the, uh, 
running out of space. It's called the microchip SAM R34. And as I tried to draw before, this is LoRa plus MCU. This is, so this is Semtech SX1276 plus Cortex Zero. So that's one long-winded answer to your question, Fosley. Okay, well, that's good to know that uh, it's expanding. Yeah, so uh, funny, funny you mentioned uh, ST micro microelectronics because some guy just walked in my office uh, this afternoon from ST microelectronics <laughs> unannounced, and he's like, "Oh, I want to buy a uh, what do you want to buy? Uh? Oh, some some haters for his Arduino." <laughs> Yeah, so That's I don't know. Would you like to get in touch with ST Micro Microelectronics? Well, ST Microelectronics is sponsoring some of our parts on the parts list, so we're already in touch with them. Okay. But if you okay. think that the office in Singapore um, has interest in this project in order to move it or migrate from microchip to ST, for example, mm -hmm. um, then yeah, we, sh we could consider these type of things, have a new version. I'm not sure if you said ST micro or Semtech. No, I'm getting mixed up. ST micro. ST micro. Yeah. Right. We actually have no offering that in integrates ST micro technology yet, but we have received a load of chips from them. And the next, uh, there will be at least a design. I'm not sure when that will appear because it takes so long to test these things. Yeah. Um, that will include ST micro um, uh, technology. Feel free to tell your contact that, and you know if they if they want to know what's taking so long, or if we need extra help, or if they want to <laughs> learn about LoRaWAN in general, and all of these things are, are, um, you know what um, interests us as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one more question: Do you know of any like successful commercial projects which are built on LoRa already right now? Um. I mean, how can I answer that question? I, I do know of one in England, it's called LoPi. They're kind of building a LoRaWAN stack in Python and making it easy for users to hook up their devices to LoRaWAN by buying a LoPi um, transceiver. Um, so uh, there, possibly there are quite a lot of these. Um, there, there are actually quite a lot of such projects that are either gateways or nodes or something similar. And I can't really list them all. There's just way too many. And I'm not familiar with them because I'm working on CENTCOM and not on LoPi. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. As in my, my question is more on, on the application level, not on the network level. Um, That's another good question. So uh, what type of applications are suitable? For example, uh, transmitting the... The, the uh, volume of a trash can is an application which is a real world problem and has been solved. At least one or two companies, none of these are doing it in an open source manner. So you can't download archives of KiCad design, but um, when a trash can will, you know, like a smart trash can fills up, mm -hmm. then you want to know if it's full or not. And these trash cans are put in all kinds of places in the world. Lots of these are in, you know, on ships in the middle of the Atlantic. You have a trash can. There. You still want to know if it's full or not. That's when you use non-internet technology. And LoRaWAN is a great application uh, level transport for this type of application. That's why I mentioned that the community compost project could possibly make use of a CENTCOM. Like we could somehow uni unify the projects. It's just kind of a thinking out loud situation. I wonder if Ben is still there. Does Ben have an answer to the question partially that Fosley just made, such as when the com community compost fills up and it's in a, for example, a public area like a forest, so it has no internet connectivity, how does it send its data to the ThingSpeak server, right? Is it gonna use LoRaWAN or something else, Sigfox maybe, or LTE? Uh, what is it called? Uh, I assume it's just Wi-Fi. <laughs> but there is in, there is no Wi-Fi in forests. Because in the, uh, I, I think those, those I mean he's um, 
his whatever box is actually close to the CC or something. So he's yeah. probably tapping into the Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think in Singapore someone is paying uh, a six fox for something like this uh, unless there's a lot of money involved in the project. So I, I think it's, it's the prototype, proof of concept, and then you tap into the Wi-Fi uh, close to the, the the community center, uh, and, and then you just. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, we, we know uh, yeah, this, this project is not uh, not already. Uh, but I think actually Ben actually gave a talk about Laura before. He, he did a project on it. Okay. Yeah, so probably he could uh, integrate it. Yeah. Uh, I think at some point, whatever you want to talk to the cloud, you, you need yeah. some Ethernet and somewhere it has to be a private or a box somewhere that, that, that someone has to pay. And uh, so the cost is there already. But, but I would say, certainly... you no, know, because all of us have, uh, I mean, we have, <laughs> we have ESP, you know, in, in every box everywhere. Yeah. So, so everywhere now. Yeah, it's it's like you know, <laughs> uh, we we're buying uh, another Raspberry Pi Pico. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, no, no. Uh, but, but I mean, you know, it, it would be nice to experiment with you know ha having two at least. Uh, I, I'm interested to know the the stack on the Raspberry Pi. Is it already fully developed? Uh, up to a point where we can uh, link everything with the uh, with any C program or Python. All the binding is already already there. Uh, yeah, but you have the wrong perspective. It's not very easy to understand. But this MCU right here, it's actually able to work without a Raspberry Pi. So all of the firmware that you develop using a C compiler, downloading the source code, it's going directly to the MCU. It's not going to run on a LoRaWAN stack on the Raspberry Pi. That's another but, uh, difference. But uh, the, the the LCU is talking to the Raspberry Pi through the SPI interface, right? Through the uh, serial unit interface, RX and TX. Yeah, I think it's just to send data. Uh, it's right. a UART, is it? Okay, yeah, okay. to the application. Okay. So, so on the Raspberry Pi, uh, okay, okay, okay. So it's like a like a basic modem. Uh, okay, okay. Like the like the model. That's right. Yeah. And that's what allows us to abstract this software layer or uh, the stack, as you say, from Arduino, which would require obviously a completely different stack than Raspberry Pi. ESP is 10 Celica, but the next ESPs will use RISC. You see, so if we if we were doing the software on the host, it would require us to, to maintain a whole bunch, maybe even a dozen of different um, architectures and so on. And by doing it this way, by running everything on the MCU, we can just attach a battery to this device, Brahim, and we don't even have a host. There is no ESP32, there's no Raspberry Pi, we just have a battery on here and it works and it can be integrated into a, a smart trash can or a lamp host or all of these different devices out in the open, which have no internet connectivity. So but the, 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 the information still go through the UART. So after the UART, you have to deal with it one way or another. It doesn't need to go through the UART, right? You can gather data directly on this board. It has an ALS, an ambient light sensor, a thermistor. So you can generate data on the board and transmit it over LoRaWAN, and there is absolutely no host that controls it or gives it data because all of the data is generated on the board. That's just one of the use cases. Most people oh, will okay, want okay, to so generate okay. data on their ESP32 or their Raspberry Pi. They will send in numbers or colors or encoded information, and that's what they want to transmit. That's the standard use case, but it's not mandatory. This device can be standalone. You can connect a, a battery to it, and it works without any host. I, Michael, I see like there's a um, USB port or something on the bottom right-hand corner of it. Um, maybe not this uh, screen. Yeah. Let's see. Yes, I think this is the best picture where yeah, you show where it shows. Is that the a USB? Is that just a power port or? Um, it yes it um, it. It can be used to power uh, the device. Mm -hmm. uh, it can also transmit data to the device. So you can flash the, these are all advanced features which we have not um, implemented yet, okay. uh, Fasley. So if, like I mentioned before, there are two versions of the device. I think it's, I wrote it somewhere else, but there is the EDU, which has no USB port. 
and there's a DEV. This has all of the features, right? So this has this has the uh, USB. It has the battery. It has a larger MCU. It has a SMA connector. It comes with an antenna. It has a, a secure element. And if we commercialize the DEV model, for example, at 12 geeks or uh, pocket science lab style commercialization, then we will uh, implement enough logic into the USB port to at least allow it to power the device and communicate uh, like the UART uh, serial connector does. Does that answer your question? Yep, yep, it does. Regarding power, uh, this battery here, this actually um, does not power the entire device. It only backs up um, the, the configuration and the data on the device so that if you disconnect it from a Raspberry Pi, that your data is still uh, um, is not erased. Right? And the other power options are through the, the, the Raspberry Pi connector um, and then there are some test points as well, which are useful for powering the device. And we don't really have a feature, a hardware feature of like a lithium uh, battery, which you can recharge. These are circuits which co could go on the back of the board, but we have to, we have to kind of uh, stop implementing sometime and, and turn to maintenance and support. So we have not developed any rechargeable lithium battery pack. Mm -hmm. yeah. For geopositioning, for example, the thing, the application that GPE is so interested in would be very, very useful to have a battery pack on there. Um, and we're all hackers. So if you go to 12, to Singapore SG hackerspace, um, as soon as it opens again, then there's really easy ways to hack one of these devices to become portable and mobile and hang it off of a weather balloon or put it on your bicycle. So that's what, one reason that all of the parts are very large so that you have the option to solder um, onto them and to attach new and power uh, supplies, you know, har power, energy harvesting, whatever you need, you can probably do it. Okay. Well, okay. I think I have to go off. So uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, if anyone no it's dinner time in person. Singapore, isn't it? Uh, it's actually bedtime. <laughs> it's time, <laughs> 9 p.m. <Okay. laughs> yeah, I have to put my kids to sleep. I actually have another meeting after this. So nice to see you again. Um, hope to see you um, maybe next Hackware. You can join. Yep, or maybe at a fall session. Then. Yeah, that's my plan. I'll yeah. see you. I'll see you all. all. Right. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you.